who is sitting in the room, and I'm going to try and capture your names um, and what board you're running for. Uh, I would appreciate it, but it also helps you kind of get to know one another if you don't already. So this we know is Cindy. She's busy digging in her purse. Uh, those of you running for the North Wasco board will want to know her. <laughs> she's the board secretary and the assistant to the superintendent and other duties as assigned. <laughs> like setting up meetings like this. Anything you would like to say by way of introduction, Cindy? Um, thank you for coming. This is great. Um, being a school board member, I've done this for 23 years in my position, and this is a hard job. So thank you. Thank you for stepping up. Appreciate you guys. And then we'll just go like kind of down this road, down the middle road, down the back row. Is that all right for process? Love to hear from you. Bethany Baker, current school board member for B21 and running in Zone 5 for the main election. All right, so you have some experience in Bethany. Very nice. I'm Erica Flores, um, running also for B21 and uh, Zone 1. Um, and I've lived in the Dallas for 10 years, grew up in Hood River, so this is my home. Yeah, and I don't have previous board experience, but I am very excited. Sometimes board experience, like on the library board or a hospital board, or even like for me, a preschool board, can sometimes translate. So it's good to know if you've had any board experience. So if any of you have, have had any, please feel free to share. I didn't think to ask that, but good information. Thanks, Erica. Thanks, Beth. I'm Jose Aparicio, candidate in D21 as well for Zone 6. Um, and I have kind of a, a call behind the scenes with school board. I, manage a lot of the uh, construction related work for Hood River County School District. Ah. And so I work alongside that board and, and that team uh, very intimately as part of my, my job. Ah, so you have some some uh, exposure as yes. well as familial exposure, which we'll find out in this moment. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Jose, appreciate that. Uh, Doug Nelson, uh, I'm Jose's father-in-law. I'm here to support him. Um, I am currently on the High Desert ESD board and have been for seven years, and I'm a past president, I can't remember how many, past president of OSBA, and retired school superintendent, and soon to be a, a resident of uh, the Dallas. We're going to close on a house in about a month. So. Oh, well, that's going to impact your high desert ESD. We're going to run, just 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 run the school board for our grandson. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to have you here, Doug. Good morning, my name is Magdalena Peraza, but I go by Maggie, and I'm running for Zone 3. I grew up here in the Dallas. I don't have any experience, and I'm running for the District 20. Great, thank you. We're glad you're here, Maggie. Thanks. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Susan Valley with Mosher Community School, the Executive Secretary there. Um, always appreciate any opportunity for OSBA training. It's a fabulous, fabulous thing. As well as, um, I'd like to see who's running for our zone. And of course, we have a great relationship with D21, and we want to continue to nurture that. And which zone are uh, Mrs. Mosher Community School? Oh, that would be Erica. Yes. All right. So nice to see you again, too, Susan. Good morning. I'm Stephanie Ritchie, and I'm running for the ESD board for Zone 1. And there isn't enough time to list my experiences. I've been in education for 48 years, and much of that time reporting to boards. And so I'm kind of looking forward to the, the other side of the table. Oh. <laughs> but really appreciate the work that school boards do. Very cool. Glad to have you. Thank you, Stephanie. Candy Armstrong, Superintendent of North Wasco County School District. And thank you all for coming. I so appreciate you being here. Um, North Wasco has been fortunate enough to have a tremendous relationship with Oregon School Boards Association since the beginning, and, and they've offered us uh, so much help and continue. So thank you. Our pleasure. Hi, Josh Ferris. I'm a community organizer. I'm very concerned that we're going to pass a bond that will actually create more homeless students. Um, we have an extremely rent burdened city as it is in the Dallas, and uh, affordability is a big issue. I'm also going to uh, root out corruption and privatization in the uh, district. For example, the superintendent has blackballed me from working in the district as a result of my uh, candidacy and, uh, and uh, asking questions about the prison contractor that runs our finances and 
and uh, any maintenance and food services. So I look forward to uh, serving on the school board. Which board are you running for? Zone 5. Zone 5 of? Uh, right in the heart of uh, the Dells. Uh, for District 21. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm just, uh, my name is John Frederick. i am been involved in education my entire life. I have 12 years school board experience, two here, and the rest back in Illinois. So I'm, I'm just here as an observer. To, You're not running? Now I'm not, no, I'm not, no, my zone is enough. Ah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Otherwise I probably would. Be. <laughs> so disclaimer, I worked with John back in 2012 when he was on the North Wasco board and I was doing some work with the North Wasco board. And then not least, but last, um, I'm the lonely only, I guess. I'm, <laughs> I'm from South Wasco County and I'm running for the board out there. Um, we have an awesome school district, but a few years ago I identified that we needed more support. So I started the South Wasco County Parent Teacher Organization and we have uh, raised money, candy boxes, brought back a music program. Super excited about our schools and I just want to provide more support as a as a school board member. All right. And Tammy, right? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Sorry. I'm mm -hmm. I have one more. All right. We have another introduction. Yeah. So Cassie Ware, who is actually live streaming, um, she says, I'm Cassie Ware. I'm running for Zone 6. I served on the Republican Precinct Committee. I'm looking forward to learning more about the ins and outs of our board and how it serves to you. All right, very good. Welcome, Cassie, and anybody else that may be live streaming. So uh, glad to have you all here. You might have noticed this desire to outcome slide here, and I did tell you in our introduction we're going to do a really very broad overview of uh, your authority your responsibility and your roles. But are there any specific questions that I can capture here? And if it's not answered in the presentation and our coffee together this morning, that we can hang out afterwards perhaps and, and answer one-on-one -on -one if I'm not able to work it in. But are there any real specific questions? Um, and if you're live streaming, email them to Cindy. Are there any things that I can capture on here that is specific to school board work. Um, I'm gonna just make a little disclaimer, John, because of your opening statement, that we're not here to deal with issues in the community. We're here to talk about broad school district work. Um, and I would hope that this would not be like a platform for anybody's position, because it's just other school board members in the room. We're not um, at a candidate's fair. And so you don't have to convince anybody to vote for you. Um, and I just say that only because of your opening statement of how you introduced yourself. But same applies to anybody else here. Are there some questions about school board work that we could perhaps capture up here and make sure that we answer for you that you're really curious about and may or may not come up in the presentation? And then we'll answer. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to... Uh learn more about alternative funding sources and uh, I'm also curious about uh, privatization of services obviously a slew of other things that maybe the candidates will do yeah and that's more into uh, these are more into the detail-ish aspect of board work or um, we might have to have more of a conversation on the side. We'll see. I don't plan on really addressing these in the broad scope of school board work in the two hours that we have this morning. Uh, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how the, the conversation emerges, what, what happens in it. But uh, these kinds of specifics weren't in my mind as I prepped for an overarching. But we'll certainly have some conversations afterwards if I don't get to it tomorrow. Um, I think one of the intimidating things about running for the school board is how much time ah. it might be. And I would love to know the time breakdown for the average board member. All right. Okay. Jose? I don't know if we'll get into it much, but just the relationship between, say, North Wasco, and I know they support some of the community schools, just kind of that interaction between those two kind of entities, even though they're in a when you say community schools, will you help me with... So there's Mosier Community School and then Wakanda Community so School. So charter schools? Charter schools. Yes. Okay. 
I'm going to abbreviate interview with charge schools. Committees of the board. <laughs> kind of how they work? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, sir. Oversight of the superintendent. That big one. school board meeting should look like. Uh, I, I'd also like to uh, uh, learn about budget deficits and how they're handled. Mm -hmm. I don't even think I know how to spell that. Deficits. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes? Is that it? Phonics did not work for me. <laughs> I know I was a full language kid. Those of you in education will understand what that means. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Well, um, as I said, I am open to questions too as we go along. And uh, we'll see um, how much of this is covered in the presentation and what we might need to circle back to um, as we move through. So I promised you that I would start with authority, where the authority comes from for school boards in Oregon, and it's in our state law. There are a whole bunch of chapters in our state law that impact school board work, but the primary one is in um, Statute 332, which is Local Education um, Administration for ESDs. It's 334. So your primary scope of work. Uh, now, certainly not everything that's <coughs> going to impact you, the uh, public meeting law, for example, is in Chapter 192. It's not in Chapter 332. But information about school boards is in 332 or 334, respectively. And it's there that the state says, we're going to have school boards, and then this is what school boards are going to do. So if you're going to look then you could see, this is a, a web a shot like of the, uh, if you went to the state's, Secretary of State's page and you're looking up Oregon Revised Statutes, you would see that chapter section 326 to 360 is there. And if you see here, 332 is local administration of education, that's K-12, 334, education service district. And there's other sections for community mm -hmm. colleges, there's other sections for um, higher ed that kind of lays things out. Uh, charter schools, I don't believe, are in this section, but they might be. I am not an expert on charter school law. Um, Kristen Miles, my colleague, is if you need to have specific questions about charter school law. So it says here, um, and it almost mirrors the same in 334, uh, but here, 332, number two, you shall have directors on a school district and that they have to take an oath. So they shall, in their capacity, be known as a school board, district school board, and they have to qualify by taking an oath before assuming office. It doesn't matter where the oath is administered. It doesn't matter who it administers it. It could be at midnight in the middle of the football field by the janitor, but you still just have to take an oath, uh, according to state law. And state law says that you're going to be called a district school board. I have a question. Yes. Who holds the board accountable legally at the state level? Nobody, really. Kind of like that. I mean, the local voters hold school boards accountable. Um, they can recall members of a board if they don't like the uh, direction of the people that they voted for. They feel like that the school board's out of line. The local voters could then recall them. We don't have, uh, well, there, I'm going to back it up. There is some accountability at a state level um, when it comes to things like ethics and violation of public meeting laws. And that's the Oregon Government and Ethics Commission. But as far as an oversight body, like we get calls at OSBA 
somebody thinks, from a community member, thinks their school board's out of line and they want us, um, the school board association, to fix them. Um, and we don't do that. We are not a compliance organization. So um, there is not a compliance organization for school boards in that respect as far as um, local decisions that they make and how they choose to run their meetings and things along those nature. But uh, ultimately, they answer to the voters. And then when it comes to violation of public meeting law or violation of ethics laws that all elected officials are subject to, that's the Oregon Government Ethics Commission that oversees that. Also the courts. I mean, if somebody feels like that a school, school board or a school uh, board member has broken some law, they can, of course, challenge that in the courts. And then it would be up to a, a, a court to decide whether or not a school board has violated any law. But a court won't take up an issue that it feels needs to be handled by the Government Ethics Commission. But if an interested citizen contacts the Government Ethics Commission and says they believe an individual board member or a school board has violated some aspect, and if it's under their jurisdiction, they'll take it. If it's not under their jurisdiction, they'll say so. Yes, John? Could you say a little about uh, the process for recall of board members? It's a local process. One would start with their uh, county elections office and uh, get instruction from the county elections office as to what the requirements are. There's generally um, a petition that's circulated throughout the community and a certain number of signatures are required and then the question of recall is placed on a ballot. So then the electors of the district would vote yes or no to recall. The most recent place that I'm aware that this happened was in Klaskenai. They recalled several school board members um, in Klaskenai within like the last two or three years. It's hard for me to keep track of history when it parades by um, over several years. But uh, that's generally the process. And then every four years, automatically, people have an opportunity to weigh in on whether they want to reelect a board member or elect somebody else. Unless, of course, they run on a post, as I did the two times I ran for my school board, um, I was on a post. So just a, a follow up on that. Since, for example, North Wasco is zoned, mm -hmm. would that work on a, I, I mean, how would, would it be all the people, of, because the only people that vote for a particular board member are those from the zone. Right. So how would a recall work in that situation? I would imagine it would be similar. That the people who elect are the people that can okay. on elect, if you will, okay. you know, by recall. And it's a percentage of the vote that they were voted on, correct? I don't know. I would. That's why I said you would need to start with your county elections office. I'm not an expert on on school board elections and what all is entailed in that. I just know that. Whenever there's questions like that, I just always say, call, you, call your county election office, <laughs> and they will guide you. Um, so that's, that's not my area of expertise. So the power of a school board also lies in state statute, and it says that you may do these things. In some instances, it says that you shall do those things, and so you need to look at the law to find out. But in this one, just as an example of some of your powers, you fix the day of the year and the hours of the day when school will be in session. So we're going to start school on September 3rd. We're going to end school on June 5th. And we are going to have a 9 to 3 school day. That kind of a fix the days of the year and the hours. Most boards then look at a calendar that says these are going to be our, this will be the dates of our spring break. This will be the dates of our winter break. These are the holidays we're going to observe, um, and these are the days that we go set aside for conferences, and things of that nature is because of this aspect of the law. So that's why school boards generally adopt what we call the calendar for the year, because it's right there. It says that you'll adopt textbooks and other instructional materials. Here's the more law that's cited, and the courses of study for schools, and I didn't keep it all going, but you can see that there's a, a list of things that school boards do. And so we kind of refer to this aspect of, as adopting the curriculum. Now, curriculum is a very loaded word, and it can mean a lot of things. But it, 
it basically, when we say it at OSBA, what we're referring to is this, that generally in school districts, there's a committee of people that look at a variety of textbooks from various vendors. They look at the educational outcomes that the school district is intending to uh, deliver, and they decide which of these materials is best suited to help the school district get to where they want to go with this student learning. And so they'll make a recommendation to the school board, hey, we recommend you adopt this, these set of textbooks for mathematics, these set of textbooks for English language arts, social studies, so on and so forth. <coughs> and it comes back to this aspect of the law. So those are the kinds of things that you see in law that talk about uh, just kind of generally school board's responsibilities. There is a lot to being on a school board. And so OSBA has this booklet. Should you get elected, you can have access to this if you would want to see it. As you can see from this table of conduct uh, contents, there are nine chapters. Uh, so there's a lot of information in there. Some of the things that you you were curious about might be um, answered in this booklet. How the school board operates, the role of the chair, the board and the superintendent, that oversight of the superintendent. Question, policy budget, collective bargaining, there's information in there that might answer some of those questions you have. The board and public engagement, the board as individuals. What about the ESD, the Education Service District board member, and the Community College board member. So there's a lot of information that's in this booklet, and obviously I can't cover all of that. But that is available, and if you get elected, uh, you have access to a copy of that um, that we can make available as uh, part of your membership with OSPA. Tamara. Are there any Oregon administrative rules that govern school boards? Yes, yes, there definitely are. Um, absolutely, and that's a really good question. So there is a difference between the revised statute, which is the law, and then the administrative rules that sometimes accompany the law that go into more detail. I didn't include any of those today, but you're um, certainly welcome to contact us with any questions specifically that you might have about any particular, um, we could refer to those as OARs, or again, administrative rules, but yes, absolutely. And particularly what we call Division 22 in the OARs, uh, <clears throat> that one is specific to a lot of, to K-12 districts that these school districts have to do these certain things that are listed inside of Division 22, and a school board every year by October 15th, I believe. No, I don't know. Maybe you remember the date. Maybe you remember the date. But at some point, school boards have to certify that their school district is in compliance with Division 22. It's an annual event that school boards do. And how they do that is their superintendent brings them a statement that says we're, we're doing all of these things. And if they're not doing it, they explain why. And um, then that is a part of the discussion. And, and you go on from there. It depends on what the why is. So yeah, This might be a good point to yeah. talk about the relationship between school districts, school boards, ODE, and the State Board of Education. OK. This, um, so, uh, why don't you? <laughs> what, what is it in particular that you're thinking about that, Doug? Well, I mean, I mean in specifically. To the question, the, mm -hmm. a lot of the OARs come from the State Board of Education. So, they set some of the particular rules that school districts and school boards have to follow. And, but that they only set the rules they, again, are not uh, necessarily oversight of the school board, but they do have the impact on the administration of the <coughs> OARs. So a good example of that is graduation. So the State Board of Education states a, a minimum expectation of our public education kids to graduate from high school. They have to have four years of English, uh, two or three years of math. I can't stay current on everything. But they kind of provide a, a, a floor, if you will, of expectations from the State Board of Education that is an administrative rule for graduation of students from a public high school. And then the local school board, though, can um, add to that. So when I was on my school board, it was way back in the dark ages when we had this legislation called SIM and CAM, 
If any of you remember that, Certificate of Initial Mastery, Certificate of Advanced Mastery, and we had, and then we ended up rescinding, which is sad, but we had made at our school board a requirement of passing the SIM in order to get a high school diploma. The state didn't require that in the OAR. Nobody was um, enforcing that from a state level, from the state board or the Department of Education or any of those things. But we, as a local school board, had said for our kids, we wanted a diploma from our high school to let everybody know that they would, had also earned the SIM. And then we backed off of that because of the time thing didn't come in. That's another subject. Mm -hmm. But the, um, the local school board is definitely impacted by decisions made at the legislature. Any law changes are going to impact you. When the legislature says you have to have a policy on X, for example, bullying and hazing, when that was becoming more publicly aware um, and there was more concern about that, the legislature got involved and they said, okay, school boards, you have to have a policy on X. Um, and so um, you did. <laughs> we helped with that. We provided some sample language for you, but each school board then had to make its own decision. But for the most part, other than when there's laws like that or graduation requirements or other such requirements, you get to decide locally what you want for your schools, what education outcomes you want for your students, and what inputs you're going to put into the system with the budget that you have to get those educational outcomes. Um, so you have a fair amount of what we in Oregon call local control. So we definitely have a state that has laws that impact you, and we do have the hierarchy of organizations with the State Board of Education that oversees the Department of Education that does impact schools and ESDs. But um, for the most part, when you're sitting at a board meeting and you're making a decision about something on your agenda, you're probably not thinking about the Department of Education or the State Board unless it's being told that you have to do something. Does that kind of get at what you were talking about, Doug? Because I wasn't yeah. exactly sure where you're, what you wanted to do. So that's your authority. Um, now we're going to talk about your responsibility. They are twofold, um, as I see them. Your responsibility is to govern and to provide oversight. Those two aspects are pretty much what is expected of you from that law and from the people in your community that elect you. Is they want you to govern the district and they want you to provide oversight of the district. So we're gonna look at the governance piece first. You might be aware of this. I don't know why I wasn't for a long time, since I was a school board member starting in 1995. But school boards have to fulfill all three branches of government. And they have to do that simultaneously. And it, it happens in such a way that sometimes you don't realize it. But generally, <coughs> in the United States, when people get elected to an office, they get elected as a legislator that's going to go to Salem or go to Washington, D.C., that's going to propose laws and vote on passing those laws that, yep, this is going to be our law. This is in a school district's parlance. This is going to be our policy. And they are only a legislator. That's really the only aspect of their job. Some people get elected into an executive office, like a governor or a president, that will eventually sign those bills into law, and it's not until there's a signature by the executive that it's actually the law of the land. And then, of course, we know there's the whole process of veto and all of that kind of stuff. But they're not in the room necessarily proposing the laws. They might speak to them. We know that that happens. Governors weigh in, presidents weigh in on what they think the law of the land should be, but ultimately it's the legislators that make those decisions. And then we vote on judges in some instances, and in some instances they're appointed, but when somebody gets elected as a judge, their only job is a judge. They hear cases in whatever type of court that they have been elected into, and they have to follow all of the rules of being a judge. You get to do all three. Mm -hmm. And that makes your job that much more challenging when you try to govern. Because it's not clear cut, 
just one job. Now, the majority of the people who elect you are going to see it as just one job. They're going to see it as your legislative job. And that's why it's really important for you to get this foundation out of the gate, if you will, that you have all three aspects to your governance. And we're going to talk about it a little bit different. I mean, a little bit more in a minute. Sorry, that doesn't show up on the screen very well. The white letter it says government. Your job, as opposed to the superintendent's job, is to manage. Her job is to manage. Um, well, we have a she in the room. Uh, my apologies. <laughs> Your superintendent's male. <laughs> I believe he was. Um, so, uh, governing, you set the direction. You say, we want our school district to go this way. We want our ESD to result in this. This is where we want you to take us. We want 100% graduation. We want third graders reading at grade level. We want, we want, we want. Um, as a school board, you get to set that direction of what you want for the kids in the communities that you are governing. And then it's up to the superintendent to steer the ship to get you there and to manage all of the processes inside that ship. The uh, operations, the finance, the instruction, uh, all of those different pieces of running a school system fall to the superintendent. They steer the ship. And there's a, uh, we're going to get to another slide that's on the second page in your notes there in a little bit. So as we talked about, um, we have a federal branch with a president, and we have a federal legislature, if you will, with Congress, and we have a federal court system which is the Supreme Court. We have a state governor. We have a state house of legislators. And we have an Oregon Supreme Court. And then we have North Wasco School District. And this one is actually Prairie City. <laughs> uh, so then we have you with your executive, your legislative, and your judicial role. You are being executive when you adopt policy. When you vote and say, yep, this is going to be the policy in our district. We are approving this um, bullying and hazing policy that the legislature says we're going to have and the actual voting on it. Once all of the haggling about the language and what it should say is done, and you actually vote, all those in favor say aye, those opposed say no, that's when you're acting in a in executive capacity, it's like the governor signing a bill into law. When you approve contracts, these could be collective bargaining contracts, this could be a contract with your superintendent, this could be a contract with um, an architectural firm to do some work for you. But when you're actually in the approving process of all those in favor say aye, all those opposed say no, the ayes have it, the contract's approved, the board has just acted in an executive capacity. Same thing um, when you adopt goals. And for however long of a timeline, these are our goals, you're being executive. Basically, it's any final votes. You're being legislative when you're having the conversation about what should our policy language say? What should we have in our policy language? What do we want the rules of our school district to be? What do we want the rules of our ESD to be? What are how are people expected to behave? How are we going to behave in certain situations? And all of that is hashed out in the conversation about the policy itself. You're being legislative. When you're negotiating the contracts, when you're sitting down at the table and you're having the conversation with your collective bargaining agreements, I mean your collective bargaining um, parties, either your teachers or your classified or if you're sitting down with a superintendent negotiating a contract, you're being legislative. When you are developing the goals and having conversations around what should they be, you are in the process of making some uh, decisions based on give and take, information, dialogue. You're not saying it shall be so. You're having the conversation of what, what is it that we want and how do we want it to play out. Uh, adopting the textbooks that we talked about earlier or setting the days of the calendar. And the story, one of the first things that I did as a new board member is I convinced our school board to go with a calendar different than what had been proposed by the school district. And for whatever reason, the rest of the board went along with me instead of overriding me. 
um, and going with the what was recommended by the school district. And there were negative ramifications throughout the remainder of the school year because of that decision of the school board to change the calendar. I was wearing my mom hat, I will confess. I was sitting there thinking about this calendar from a mom perspective, and I wasn't sitting there looking at this calendar from an education perspective. And so it had a negative impact on the school district that year. And the next year after that, I made sure I didn't just wear my mom hat when I sat at the board table, but that I also wore what's best for all of the kids in the district and what's best for the educational practice. But it goes to show you that as an individual board member, you can sway the rest of your fellow board members to go with you to your point of view and you think you're absolutely right in the moment and think you're doing the right thing, you could find out later, well, maybe it wasn't the right thing. Um, but we come at it with good intentions. We don't mean to do things inappropriately. John. Josh. Josh, I'm so sorry. Uh, could you say more about your, mis your, your uh, self-described mistake on that? I've heard people talk and complain to me talking to them about different start times for their kids that are at different grade levels and how frustrating that is as a parent. Right. And they said, we have to change that. It's, you know, it drives me crazy. Is that something that you made a mistake on? Was that? So the, the uh, proposal didn't have to do with start and stop times that, that I was involved in. It uh -huh. had to do with the breaks for conferences. So they wanted to have elementary schools out a certain week um, kids wouldn't be going to school, but they, they would be having parent, student, um, teacher conferences. And then a different week for the middle school. And I'm like, but we need the middle school kids to watch the younger kids, because a lot of parents work. And so why can't those be on the same week? And so I think that we should have a calendar where those are on the same week. And the rest of the board saw the wisdom of my argument. And we the calendar where we moved the middle school uh, conferences a week earlier. Well, what I found out later, I mean, it wasn't dire, huge, horrible circumstances, but it was um, a week before grading period ended. And so the middle school curriculum wasn't at a place where teachers could have finished the term, done the grading, and had a uh, term's worth of information to share with parents. So it wasn't horrid but it just goes to show that it wasn't made in the decision of an educational outcome for kids. And it wasn't made from that perspective, it was made from the mom perspective of, we need built-in babysitters, we need those middle school kids home with those elementary kids, because we had a lot of working parents. And, you know, why have kids out two different weeks? When it comes to start and stop times and decisions like that, generally there's an educational reason behind early um, releases in the afternoon or late starts in the morning. There's generally uh, an, an education reason for that. And I know that when I was on my board, I'll tell you, I struggled a lot between the educational purpose of the school district, the overarching reason why we send kids to school is to get an education, and the daycare aspect of schools and the fact that parents are relying on schools to be the place where they can drop their kids off by eight o'clock every morning and know that they're there until three o'clock every afternoon, except for the stated holidays and, and breaks, and that it's very inconvenient on parents if we have one school that doesn't start until 9.30, when the other one starts till eight. And so as a school board, you have to weigh what is the purpose of the organization against the inputs that it takes for the organization to reach those desired outcomes. So basically, what is going to, what is it going to take input-wise to get the educational outcomes you want? And it might mean the school starts later and this school gets out earlier. And so you have to look at it in the holistic picture and not just how does it impact me as a parent in my daycare needs. Another question and then John. I noticed that our current board has quite a few high ratio of unanimous votes. Can you speak about if a board member can vote contrary to the board, even if their vote will not change the outcome? And then she said, can a board seek to find that balance? Oh, this is separate. But 
can boards seek to find that balance in talent during these versus academic needs, or would that be up to the superintendent? Well, there was two questions. Sorry. Yeah. So according to the law, the board gets to start, uh, <coughs> do the start and stop times and uh, the number of hours or something like that. I, I, I have to go back to the slide. So a calendar is a district uh, school board's decision. It's usually made with lots of input from staff. So I'm answering her second question first. Uh, usually the staff comes with a recommendation. So for the, the 1920 school year, this is what we're gonna recommend. We're gonna recommend we start August 15th because we're anticipating a horrible winter and lots of snow days, right? That we didn't anticipate this year. So we're gonna start way early or we're gonna start in September after Labor Day like we traditionally do. But or whatever the case may be, the school district would bring a proposal to the school board. And the school board to certainly ask all of those questions to balance all of those things out, like the example that I gave of my own story, and ask for the rationale of the educators, why this calendar? What is this going to bring us? How are we gonna realize our educational outcomes with this kind of a calendar? and have that conversation. And you are being legislative when you are having all of the conversation about the um, calendar as an input to the education process. Calendar is one piece of input. You have to have <coughs> educators, you have to have textbooks, you need to have uh, maintained schools, so on and so forth. So you can have all of that debate and then ultimately it's gonna be up to the board to decide. So Cassie, it's up to the board to decide. <laughs> Um, but hopefully you are doing it from a perspective, not just of your own convenience or of your friends um, when it comes to daycare, like, hey, I need the middle school kids home to watch my little kids. Um, but you're doing it from an, an education output input. And then Cassie had a second question and then John had a question. Um, so we haven't really gotten into board meetings yet, but I have a personal philosophy that board members need to vote their conscience they need to vote what it is that they believe in, but they need to make that known to their fellow <coughs> board members. So if a board member wishes to vote no on any calendar or textbooks or policy or budget or any of those other things they wanna vote no, you should explain to your fellow board members why. What is it that you're unhappy about? And try and convince them to your point of view like I did with the calendar, you just might win, you don't know. Um, but if you just vote no out of the blue and nobody knows why you voted no, it's gonna, it can cause some um, consternation with your fellow board members. We were approving a charter school one time. We had an application for a charter school and we had gone through all of the process that are involved in it and we were at the step where the school board accepts it or doesn't accept it. So it becomes a charter school in our district or it doesn't. And so we were having the conversation with the people there that were representing this charter school, and one of my fellow board members voted no. To this day, I don't know why. And it was within her rights to vote no. That was totally fine. But whatever her reasonings were, I didn't know. And I couldn't benefit from that. And I could not take that into consideration as to an influence on my vote. So my feelings are, yes, you don't have to always vote 7-0. You can vote 6-1, 5-2, 4-3, or even the other way, 3-4 and something fails. But you should really explain any no vote that you have. Now, John, you had your hand up at one point. Using your conference schedule, example, was all decided at one meeting or was that over a period of two or three meetings? So the committee met several times, I'm sure. Uh, the calendar committee met several times and I was so new, I was a brand new board member. I don't know if there was a board member that was on that committee or not. You know, sometimes school districts, depends on how they operate, it was a question that Susan had about committees. But it was in one meeting. I mean, it was in our packet, so we knew it was coming. We had the calendar to look at prior to coming to the meeting. We had the representatives from the committee there to talk to us and answer any questions that we had, but it was done in one meeting. Didn't, it didn't seem to need to take several meetings to make that decision. The reason I bring that up is in my 10, eight years experience back in Illinois, we never made a decision at the same meeting. That something Just was Just because of those emotions, we would come back two days later, if we had to have a Thursday meeting, uh, we'd come back to vote on it, but 
the whole point was you never made a decision based on emotions. And, and in Oregon, the state allows school boards to determine how they want to govern and how they want to run their own meetings. So for example, in Pendleton, the school board there meets for a very extensive uh, work session about two or three days before their meeting. And they talk through all of these different things. And then when they come to their business meeting, those are done in about a half hour to 45 minutes because they just vote, 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 vote. Mm -hmm. They don't have a lot of discussion at their business meeting because they have had a two or three day prior uh, work session to kind of hash over everything. That's a way of doing board business that Pendleton School Board likes. So Oregon, we have the flexibility for school boards to have the kinds of governance processes that they want to have. Now, those are all open meetings to the public. I mean, they're all noticed and anybody could come to those. And they have it in their schedule to be able to come to an eight o'clock meeting on a whatever day of the week it was and have that kind of time. I worked full time when I got on my school board and I couldn't do a lot of things during the day. So we had to do our meetings at night. And we did our business meeting on the second Wednesday of the month and we did our work session on the fourth Wednesday of the month. And if we had something that we felt was gonna be controversial, we certainly hashed it out in work sessions weeks or months prior to the business meeting where we would actually vote on it. But whether a board meets, discusses, and comes back two days later, meets before, discusses, has their business meeting, or meets twice a month and deals with controversial <laughs> upcoming decisions in work sessions in preparation for, is all locally decided. You get to choose for yourself as a board how you want to hold your meetings and how you want to govern yourselves. So um, in our instance, we didn't feel like it was gonna be anything controversial and need to be you know, discussed at great length. I was a newbie, you're gonna be newbies. Um, and so I just shared that story. Josh, you had your hand raised at one point. I, I just wanted to ask, uh, I don't know if this would fit in the next section or this section, but I didn't see it in there. Uh, is there any occasions where a super majority is needed? Yes, but that would depend on certain uh, Robert's Rules of Order uh, things. So for example, when a, another uh, thing that happened on our board, we'd be debating something and talking about it. I don't know, I'm gonna use approving a charter school for an example. You know, we were talking all about it. and a board member would get frustrated and they would shout, question, which one in and of itself is not a motion. But basically what we did, which was wrong, is we just stopped our conversation at that point and voted on the, the motion that was before us. Now, in Robert's Rules of Order, to call for the question, to say, I move that we call for the question, requires two thirds of the body to stop debate. So that's a super majority rather than just a simple majority of 50% plus one. So when we just stopped debate based on her one board member saying question, we did not consider whether the rest of the board really wanted to stop debating. We just acquiesced to her, which was the wrong thing. We should have made <coughs> the motion and then had a vote on whether or not we were stopping debate and that vote is a super majority. It requires two thirds. So there are some motions inside of Robert's Rules of Order that require um, more than a, a simple majority, but from state law, when the school board is voting on anything, when the school board is adopting policy, adopting a budget, approving contracts, doing any of those things, it's just a, a, a majority of the total number of the board. So for I happen to know that North Wasco County School District is a board of seven. That means it takes four votes to pass anything, even if only four people are there at that meeting. What's your set board size? I think it's also seven. It's also seven, and yours is seven, seven and yours is five. five. So it would take three votes, and if yours was, if the ESD board is five. Um, so generally, no, it doesn't take a super majority for anything to pass when it's regular board work, but if somebody makes certain motions, Certain motions can require more if you choose to operate with Robert's Rules of Order. So your other role, judicial, is a role that happens very rarely um, on school boards. You generally, well, I'm gonna back it up. 
Once a year, you are absolutely judicial when you hold a budget hearing. The state of Oregon requires that all school boards before adopting a budget have to hold a budget hearing. They usually open it up, they ask anybody in the community who has anything to say about the budget to so speak. Usually there's nobody there, most cases, and so they close the hearing and they move on. So it doesn't really feel like it's judicial because it's usually just form. But this can come into play most <coughs> often when somebody in your community has complained about something. They've gone to their child's teacher or they've gone to their child's coach and they are upset about the behavior of this individual to their child. This is a typical scenario. And so they talk to the teacher, they try to get resolved for the situation, and if they feel like the situation wasn't resolved adequately to their satisfaction, they would then appeal that to this teacher's supervisor, which is generally a principal. And then if the principal didn't bring resolve to their satisfaction level, then they can appeal up to the superintendent. And the superintendent would then go through their processes and the superintendent would make a ruling. The superintendent decides on all complaints. That's in your policy. The superintendent's word is final in the matter being discussed, unless that person doesn't like the superintendent's decision. And then they appeal that to the school board. And when that happens, then the school board acts in a judicial capacity. And just like any kind of a judge who has a case in court, <laughs> that you cannot have ex parte communications with anybody who are party to the lawsuit, right? So a judge who's hearing something cannot go out and have a rendezvous conversation with the defendant or the plaintiff, neither one. You can't do that, or to whoever is um, making suit or defending themselves. Nor can board members. And this gets really difficult when people come to you way, way, way back when they were upset with their teacher and they're your neighbor and they run into you at the grocery store and they're gonna tell you what the coach did, what the teacher did with their kid and they're really upset and the only reason they're talking to you is because you're on the school board and they want you to fix it. Because we're used to going to our legislators in our state, in our system of government in the United States. We're used to contacting our senators in Washington, D.C. Um, and various elected representatives and say, fix this problem for me. That's our mother's milk here in the United States. And so as soon as you get elected, and it's gonna happen fast, People are gonna seek you out because you're on the school board and they're gonna want you to fix something for them. But if that fix something for them ever rises to an appeal of a decision by the superintendent, the aggrieved parties could accuse you of having ex parte communications. So it's a real balance. This is what's tricky for school boards because if you're a legislator, you're just a legislator. You don't have to worry about what happens in the courts necessarily. I mean, you do, you're mindful, you don't wanna break laws, but you can go out and help your person <clears throat> with an agency and get it resolved. Because you don't, as a legislator, necessarily oversee that agency, necessarily. But you oversee an agency and you will have to sit, may have to sit as a judge. So you can't have any ex parte communications and that's really hard in the beginning because you never know what may rise up to the level of the school board and what's gonna get handled at the teacher level, what's gonna get handled at the principal level, what could get handled at the superintendent level that you'll never know about. Hopefully, you'll never know about. Okay. Um, also, any evidence. How would you know what you know? So a court, a judge, can only consider evidence that's come through proper chain of command, that's uh, been documented. They can't go out and look at something else apart from the proper process of anything that is considered evidence in a court. So if you as individual members of a board are going out and um, investigating a teacher's classroom, or you're gonna go out and watch a practice because your neighbor says this coach is berating their student, or any other thing that you think um, 
people are telling you is a miss, and you're going to go out there and you're going to see for yourself. By golly, I'm going to go down to that bus barn and see what they're doing about maintaining those buses. I'm going to find out for myself. You are trying to obtain evidence that m might have to come into play and hasn't gone through a proper chain of command. So you have to think through your judicial hat when people come to you complaining about things inside the system. And you have to trust the system that it's going to work. And if you don't trust the system, that's a completely different conversation than this one instance of where there's a complaint. And if you don't trust the system, then as a school board, you need to have a conversation with your superintendent and you need to be honest about where you think there's a breakdown in the system and have a conversation about that so that you can be reassured that the system is working or you can be sh you can put in place what is necessary to ensure the system works. Because <laughs> it's not your job as individual members of a board to fix the system by yourself and to investigate complaints. Yes, Josh. I'd like you to talk a little bit more about the nuances uh, with this. I mean, if, if a, a neighbor comes up and says, I've got a problem, I, I don't imagine that I'm going to respond by putting my hands over my ears and going, yeah. la, 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 I can't talk to you, yeah, we you can, and walk away, because, because that would then be very rude. Right. But right. Like, that is something that I've seen um, yeah. board members do. They don't, like, it's not we can't talk about it, it's off the schedule, but you can you can go to the public meeting, make a public comment, yeah. you can't mention it. So, but, I mean, that's, so no, there's a nuance it, there to Absolutely to there is, and this is out a little probably bit. the most difficult aspect of board work. Because most people who get on school boards are conscientious people that want to do a good job, want to serve their communities, want to ensure that the school district is resulting in what it should result in. Right. And so if something is breaking down and not working right, that bothers us. Because we want it to work well. We want the system to work well. And, um, and most people who get on school boards feel like I, I did. You want to roll up your sleeves, you want to get involved, you want to make a difference. And so somebody comes to you with a complaint, you think, well, that's my opportunity to make a difference. You think that, right? It's, it's um, uh, human nature. But when we're thinking that way, we're not thinking about our judicial role. So what I have encouraged board members through the years that I've been doing this job, and I wish I would have known this when I was a board member, is to let the people know that there is a process for them to get their concerns addressed. And that it is in their best interest, their best interest, to not speak with you as an individual board member about this, but to go through the process. And that the process is outlined in policy and accompanying administrative rule. So there's policy KL, which is your public complaint policy. This one happens to be North Wasco's policy. And then this is the process of how the policy is enacted and followed inside the school system. This is what I talked about as board members, you need to trust the process. And if you're, you can't, if as a board member, you can't trust this process, then as a board, a whole of you need to sit down, look at the policy, look at the process, have a meeting with your superintendent, hammer out where you think the process isn't working and have conversation about that. And from a policy level, make your decisions that you need to make so that the process can work. Because if you want the people in your system to trust your process, you've got to trust your process. Because how can you ask somebody else to follow your policy if you can't if, if you don't think it works. And since policy is your responsibility, that's what you would do. So I encourage people, board members, that when somebody comes to them, and the only reason they're coming to you isn't because you're their brother, or you're their sister, or you're their cousin, or you, you know, you're, you've been friends for forever and a day. They're coming to you because you're on the school board, and they want to talk to you about X, is to let them know that it is in their best interest to not talk to you in detail about this. Here's our process, here's how it works. Let me help you understand how it works. You know, you need to go and talk to the teacher or the coach first, and then the principal, and then the superintendent. And, um, and we will address this, the, the district will address your concerns around this situation. And then remind them of your judge role. And let them know that if 
this ever rose to the level where it didn't get resolved in an early situation and you had to sit as a judge that you could be considered a biased juror and you might have to recuse yourself because you have had ex parte communications or you have gotten evidence outside the chain of command. And no judge could rule on a case that that, that has happened, not ethically anyway. Um, and you want to be an ethical juror. Did you distribute that document in this packet? I didn't. Cindy brought it this morning. It's available online. Um, it's policy KL and KL's administrative rule that accompanies it. Thank you, Cindy, for bringing that. I have a question for Pastor real quick, and this sure. goes back to the voting. Um, can votes happen at a work session? Mm -hmm. Yes. Anytime the board meets, the board meets. Whether that session is called a business meeting or a work session, it's a meeting of the board. And at a meeting of the board, they can vote. Generally, boards don't vote in work sessions. Generally, they don't, but they can. And the meeting notice would say so if they intended to vote on anything at that work session. There were occasions when I was on my board that we had to do that because something came up, couldn't wait until the next business meeting, the board needed to make a decision on it, so it was brought to the work session, but it was included in the meeting notice. Could you, or I don't know if you're gonna talk about this a little bit further ahead, but could you say something about due process for employees? For example, employees that are facing uh, non renewal of contract or disciplinary action, do they have a chance to like, say their piece, or is it purely that we get only the one side of the story from the administration? Do you see what I'm saying? I do, I do see what you're saying. So, do they have it's licensed employees that would have a contract that would get renewed or not renewed. So we're talking teachers or administrators right. here, we're not talking custodians or, so when you say employees, it can sound broad. So I'm, I'm for the clarification here, I'm narrowing it down, that it's not just anybody that works for the school district, but anybody who has a license. They are a part of a collective bargaining unit, most likely, unless it's an administrator. But if it's a teacher, a teacher has a collective bargaining agreement that within that agreement stipulates what rights they have to agree to any district action or anything that the district is doing. And so if a principal in a school working with teacher A believes that teacher A um, isn't meeting expectations, that principal is gonna work with teacher A throughout the school year and try and get teacher A's performance to uh, the level expected. If that doesn't happen, teacher A might likely be recommended from her principal or his principal to the superintendent to not renew their contract. So in Oregon, teachers that are not probationary, but they are established in a school district, have three-year contracts. And uh, for employment, we don't have tenure in the state of Oregon anymore. And so those three-year contracts automatically roll over. So this year's coming to an end, it's going away, the next year automatically happens, unless there is a vote to non-renew. So principal's been working with teacher A all year, been trying to get improvements in performance, Teacher A is very well aware of all of this interaction with principal and has had the union available to them the whole time. And so when the recommendation comes to non-renew, it's not a surprise to teacher. So what happens then is that instead of automatically rolling over, this school year is now done and we didn't renew that contract. So that teacher still has two more years of employment. And they are generally in that next year then, placed, generally they are placed on some kind of a plan of assistance that is developed usually collaboratively with the principal and the union. And so then this teacher knows what they need to do to um, improve. And if they do, great, the next year their contract's renewed again. But if they haven't met those expectations, and the board votes to non-renew yet again, now they're down to one year left on their contract. It doesn't mean they've immediately lost their job. But generally by that stage, they're looking for work someplace else or the union is counseling them out. 
So as far as due process goes, that's the way the law has been written. So um, any that's, employee that's in that situation, it's not a surprise to them. So I got all that. It sounds great. But there was a moment there where you just transitioned. The, the board voted to non-renew. Well, that's because that's all what I'm saying. When that, when that judgment is made, uh -huh. when that judgment is made, um, I, I assume, I assume, and from my own experience, 99.9% .9 of the time, that's the superintendent's recommendation from the principal's recommendation, and that the actual, the, st the staff in question has no interaction with the, ju the judicial body there. Okay, and I that's what it. I'm saying. Do they have any rights to due process in our uh, decision making at that moment when the contract is non-renewed? So due process is a very loaded word, and I am not a lawyer, or a very loaded term, and I am not a lawyer. So I'm not going to get in and speak to the nuances of the term due process. Generally, conversations about teacher A are held in executive session so that the board can kind of get a sense of why we're recommending non-renewal. Anytime an employee is discussed for discipline purposes, in executive session, they are given 24 hour notice and they are being told, Teacher A, here's your 24 hour notice. The board's meeting in executive session on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. And if you would like, if you would so request, that can be held in public. And that is, and if Teacher A says, Yeah, I want that held in public, then Teacher A and all of the conversation around Teacher A will now be in a public meeting that could be live streamed. We don't know where it will go. And but they do not have a right automatically to executive session. Can they, can they speak? Can, it, can If a board invites a them, only if a board invites them. So they don't have an automatic right into executive session. So we can allow them you to can actually present them. their side of the story. You can. You can invite them. Okay doesn't usually happen, and if you do, you will want to have legal counsel there representing the board to make sure that you don't violate any personnel law that is also coming into that, and you would want to be sure you're very aware of any collective bargaining language that might impact that conversation. Doug, you had your hand raised. Were you going to well, speak to I'm that? I was just going to say, uh, very often collective bargaining agreements will specify whether or not um, appeal rights of employees and very often, if, you, if an employee is going to be uh, appealed, they will be represented by their union or, and their legal counsel. Right. But I think also board members have to recognize that whenever they make a decision on an employee uh, job status and or uh, grievance, um, uh, resolving a grievance, there's still one more step that that employee has, and they can take it to the court. So yeah. when you talk about uh, making sure you're following proper judicial uh, procedures, there it, you may be the final step at the district level, but an employee right. or a union can always take it to the courts. So we have a, an, um, an insurance program, if you will, um, that the special districts of Oregon, like water districts, abatement districts, other districts, and school districts have joined together, and we call it PACE, Property and Casualty for Education insurance and we have a bevy of lawyers that work for PACE. So whenever a school district is in a position where they are recommending non-renewal on a contract, we advise them to talk to these PACE attorneys first to make sure that they are doing everything to try and prevent any kind of a legal liability against the school district. Because you don't want your school district to get sued because you have handled some personnel action inappropriately. Um, when school boards get, I mean, school districts get sued, oftentimes school boards are named in the suit as well, and you might be named individually. I was served papers twice during my tenure on the school board when somebody was suing the school district, and I was named as a party to that. So you want to be sure, as a board, when you are doing things that involve people's employment contracts and renewing them or non-renewing them, that you are doing that under the advice of legal counsel. And generally, the superintendent has done that when they've brought that recommendation to you. 
So a school board shouldn't just willy-nilly invite in an employee that they're considering a non-renewal of a contract for. You have that right, yes, but you should do it under the advice and guidance of legal counsel, because you might get sued and bite me. And if you're okay with that, you know, that's that's different. Tamara. Well, that brings up a question that one of the other candidates in um, South Bosco had asked. Um, is the insurance that covers the school, does it cover the board as well? There is what we call errors and omissions insurance. So if you make a mistake as a school board um, and, it, and the court de deems that it was just, you know, it was a mistake. It was an honest mistake. I mean, I screwed up the calendar. I didn't mean to mess things up for anybody. Then it would, you know, if there was a lawsuit as a result of that, then the insurance would cover me. But if I, as an individual board member, I intentionally broke the law or I did something um, egregious, then no, that's not gonna cover you. You're gonna have to do that on your own. I had to sit in front of the ethics commission once by myself as an individual board member and I had to hire an attorney to do that, to sit there at the ethics commission with me. And I, and I was there because I was a, an elected official. They didn't do anything with it, but it was my expense. I just want to be clear. I just wanted to establish that we do have a legal right uh, and ability to uh, protect uh, school district employees from administrative retaliation. So that's good. I like that we have a way to intervene and hear another side of the story. I understand the legal counsel and having a, the process and all that and the dangers of, of, law, of individual lawsuit. I appreciate that. Are you going to, uh, at this point, I'd talk about uh, administrative accountability and oversight? For well, example, we haven't even gone to the somebody. oversight piece yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we're, we're, we're getting through this a whole lot more slowly, so let me move ahead. Um, let me move out of my slides. I, I appreciate the, the thorough job you're doing. This is very serious. I'd like, I'd like to be as informed as I possibly can going yeah. into the, uh, this, a job like this. Yeah. So, um, so oversight is another aspect of your job. Um, along with the governance, the governance of setting the direction and understanding <coughs> your, your roles. Um, and when you're considering your oversight, you're really doing it in two major areas of, for your community. You are oversighting their two greatest treasures. Do you know what those are? Kids and money. Kids? Yep, absolutely. Kids and money. Absolutely. Those are the two greatest areas. And so, um, how you do that as a board, how you do that is in a meeting, because everything boards do are in meetings. And uh, this happens to be the Forest Grove board here, and we have a picture of the North Wasco board or South Wasco board. But you, you do that in a meeting. All your meetings have to be done in public, unless there's one of those 10 reasons that you can go into executive session, which I'm not gonna go into. Um, and it can be a little bit uncomfortable at first because you have to do everything in a fishbowl. And um, oftentimes at your meetings, people want to talk to you and they want to tell you what it is that they think about any given situation. And you can certainly hold meetings that um, are what we would call forums that aren't necessarily a business meeting, but you're holding a meeting to hear from people. You, like, like your budget committees are kind of like that, in that you, here's the, the budget and we're gonna hold this and wanna hear from people. You do have a policy that speaks to um, how you hear from people. North Wasco has this policy, um, I'm sure South Wasco does, I'm sure that the ESD board does as well. It's policy B, D, D, H generally, that says how people can talk to you when they come to your, your meetings. <coughs> Some boards like to follow Robert's rules of order. Some boards don't. Um, uh, it, it, there's no requirement. You can run your meetings however you wanna run your meetings according to Oregon law, but you just eventually have to vote on whatever. I mean, there has to be a record in the minutes of how people voted <coughs> according to public meeting law implying you need to vote. When you do, you have to have one voice. Uh, the board is a single entity. I might have five fingers here, and if they're a five-member board, there might be seven. Members. But if they are, <laughs> not you know, on the board yet. <laughs> yeah. But if they are, you know, it's a five-member board, and if somebody says, "I move that we take this glass from the right side over 
to the left side. And somebody says, I move that, we do that. It hasn't happened yet, but they've discussed it. Whether there are five zero that vote to move, four zero that vote to move, or three zero that vote to move, the hand has still moved even though these ones said no. Or if it's, you know, four, three, <coughs> four. So you have, the board has one voice. So in your oversight, when you are um, holding the district accountable, is what we call it, you are doing that in a meeting and you are doing that through voting. And in your handout is this, this frame. This gets at what we talked about, the rules of the board. And over here is hold the system accountable. So when you as a board are doing your oversight, you are fulfilling this role right here. And as a board, you need to have a conversation around what will we accept of evidence of progress towards our expected outcomes. Now, this could be in any aspect <coughs> of the school district. This could be your educational aspect. This could be athletic. Um, this could be facilities. This could be transportation. This could be food service. Now, ultimately, your one employee is the superintendent. And so it is going to be of the superintendent that the board is going to say, these are the things that we need to see that are going to tell us that the system is working as it's intended to work. And then they would give notice to the superintendent. Uh, this is the evidence that we need to see, and we need to see it before we vote on a budget, or we need to see it before we vote on policy such and such and such and such, or we need to see it before we buy new school buses, or we need to see it before um, we make any decisions about our food service, or whatever the case may be. So in order for the board to hold the system accountable, they do it through the superintendent, and they let the superintendent know what it is that the board wants to look at to ensure that the system is doing what the system is intended to do. And that is the oversight role. Now, the superintendent can certainly delegate and bring in any other district employee to help the board get this information that it wants to have. Could bring in the director of transportation, could bring in the director of food service, could bring in the, um, the uh, curriculum director, or whatever it is that the board is saying it wants to see in order to know that the system is doing what it's intended to do. So, and then when it comes to the uh, superintendent's behavior as an employee of the board, OSBA has some processes and some documents to help school boards do that job of evaluating the superintendent as your only employee. And so we have a um, whole booklet that explains a good timeline, explains a good process, talks about nationally recognized standards for superintendents, and um, a, a way for boards to go through as individuals on the board to evaluate the performance of the superintendent, then meet with the superintendent and have a conversation collectively on the superintendent's performance over the last period of time, whatever period of time it might be that the board is looking at the superintendent's performance. And then collectively, that one voice thing that I talked about, then collectively the board comes up with um, a performance evaluation that they can then share with the public. And the school board has met, we've evaluated the superintendent, these were the criteria, this is what we were looking at, this was you know, the tool that we used, so on and so forth, and this is how we found the superintendent's performance over this period of time. And then oftentimes what boards do in connection with an evaluation is that they make a determination about contract extension or non-renewal and compensation. Those are oftentimes tied to that evaluation process. A lot of boards don't do that job very well. Um, and it's a, you know, if you think about it, if any of you have a job and you think you're doing a good job and you think you're meeting your employer's expectations, 
but you never sit down and have a conversation about that, how do you really know if you're meeting your employer's expectations? And you're left guessing that you're doing the right job and that you're doing the best job. But if there is a system that you know that quarterly or semi-annually or at minimum annually you're sitting down with your employer and you're getting some feedback on your job, you can know better that you're meeting expectations and if you need to grow in any particular area of your job performance. School boards aren't usually very good about giving that kind of feedback to superintendents. And then they get frustrated and then they call OSBA's PACE attorneys and they say, we want to get rid of our superintendent, what do we do? And oh, by the way, they just gave them a glowing endorsement and a big raise. So if we can help um, the boards that are here in the room, and anybody that might be watching the live streaming, please work with the board development department and we will come out and we will have a conversation with your board and help you develop a process, a timeline, criteria, instruments to use so that as a board you can do that job of your, you know, of overseeing your one employee. Because the last thing you want to do is go through the huge expense of firing somebody and having to buy them out of their contract or hiring somebody and then having them not be successful because you're not giving them adequate feedback to be successful. So once you go through, and North Bosco is going to be doing this. Whoever gets on the board, you're going to be hiring a new superintendent. You're going to hire the person you think is the best person for the job. Whatever process you go through, the board is going to have to ultimately hire somebody to succeed when Candy retires. And so you're going to have to make a decision about who you hire. Don't you want the person you hire to be successful? So create a really good evaluation process that gives them feedback to the job you're expecting them to do so that they can do it well and you don't have to go through that process again right away. Josh. The, the, the current board is rapidly moving ahead with the hiring process as quickly as possible before the election. They, I believe there's a $10,000 that's going to be paid for a, a private entity to a search. Firm? Ser to search. What, where do you stand, where do you, uh, how do you think about that, that sort of process? So I think that they're, um, I went through a, a hiring of a superintendent when I was on board. Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of things that boards have to consider when it comes to personnel law in uh -huh. hiring. And so I think that boards that can have some representation from the from an outside entity that can guide them through this process and make sure that they don't do things wrong in the process and also can hopefully, a search firm can hopefully help find, attract candidates to apply for this position. And so, um, so uh, where if you're just advertising on your own as a board without any other outside help, you're, you're probably not gonna have as good a network to get into. So I think it's wise for boards to have outside help to guide them through this because it's not something that they do on a regular basis. I mean, how many years has it been since North Wasco has hired a superintendent? 15. 15. <laughs> so in 15 years, this the, the board hasn't had any experience in hiring a superintendent. So my take is get the outside help. And there's several organizations that can help it. It's money well spent, especially if you uh, can prevent somebody suing you for unfair practices in the hiring process. Stephanie, you have a question? Uh, more a comment to clarify misinformation. So the board's not moving forward necessarily with the hiring of a superintendent. We've just done our due diligence to set money aside for the new board if they want to utilize that money. So that money's just going to be line item down in the budget and the new board will be the board that actually decides how they're going to proceed, whether that be a cert firm, a consultant. So just to clarify that. I um, appreciate that. Yes. Susan. Yes, and can you also speak a little bit about the board's self-evaluation um, self as well? I can, I can. So one of these areas here is learn together as a board team. Um, one of these roles, because I've kind of jumped from the responsibilities of governance and oversight and how, do you, how are you doing your oversight 
One of the aspects of, is learning as a board team. What information does a board need to make sure good decisions are made? Some of that information that boards need is how are we doing as a board? What's our performance? And a way that perhaps that could be measured would be through a board self evaluation. OSBA has a new tool. We just <coughs> bought it. We've had like six school boards use it so far, so it's that new. Um, but we have a new board self evaluation instrument that gets at all five of these roles. And as um, so, it, it addresses the five roles. It has 22 benchmarks and it has 69 individual key indicators. Some will go towards expectations, some towards governance, some towards uh, creating conditions, holding the system accountable in your advocacy role. So um, a board self-evaluation can be a tool that a board can use to ask itself, how well are we doing our job? And can we do our job better? Are we being effective as a board? Um, and so this learning as a board team a board self-evaluation can come into that. We have like a half hour left. <laughs> you guys like need to stand up, get coffee, use the restroom. Are you taking care of your personal needs? Because I have just like been talking and I can talk about this all day. But I want to be sure that uh, you guys are comfortable and I'm not um, overloading you. Um, with I've gone up about 15 times. Good, good. I would hope the rest of you would just take care of your needs as you need to as well. So we'll keep moving ahead. So in this, this area of the presentation, you have a copy of this document in your handout somewhere. Page six. Um, I kind of skipped over. I, I did it a little bit. Uh, page four talks about um, board meetings. Somebody had questions about what a meetings look like. This is pretty much the legal information of what meetings look like because really each board can run their meetings how they <coughs> want to run their meetings. They're your meetings. You can order them, order the business in the way you want to order the business. You can have it be a free for all. You can have it be really rigid and nobody gets to speak unless they get the permission of the chair. I mean, it's it's your meeting. Um, it benefits you to run an orderly meeting. It benefits you to be civil with one another. It benefits you to ensure that there's processes so that each board member can be heard on any issue. Some boards adopt a rule that nobody can speak a second time on, the, on an issue, like we're debating a policy or whatever, until everybody's had the opportunity to speak once. You know, we don't, we're not gonna have any grandstanding or anything. But really, it's up to you to run your meetings how you want to run your meetings. But it behooves you to run well-organized meetings um, that people can um, pay attention to what's happening in the world. Page five um, in your handout kind of explains each of these roles that have to do with this document. Um, a lot of times, people have brainstorming sessions. Yes. Um, just going back to the meeting uh -huh. piece. So, um, like our our district uses uh, Robert's rules of orders, but um, <coughs> can you give me an example of a, a district or a school board that doesn't use that? Like, and but maybe they did differently. Yeah, most do. Most follow some form of parliamentary procedure. They might not follow Robert's rules of order to an exact T and you know, be very strict about Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, but they, most boards have some kind of a parliamentary process where someone says, I move that, the chair recognizes the motion, somebody else seconds it, there's conversation around whatever it is, and then the chair calls for a vote. And then in follow-up, is that always codified and available to the um, district uh, chair? Or anyone who might be attending? Well, there's always minutes that are taken of a meeting and how any, um, the minutes require who was present, mm -hmm. how they voted on any matter, or any matter that was voted upon and how it was decided, and any substantive conversation or discussion that um, led, it, that was used in the determination of the vote. 
So it's not there. They should never be verbatim minutes. We don't recommend ever verbatim minutes where Mrs. Sussler said this and Ms. Miller said this and Mr. Nelson said that. We don't recommend verbatim, but we do recommend that the minutes capture the essence. Well, it was pointed out that if we have this bullying policy, you know, this might be a ramification. Or it was pointed out if we adopt this charter school, we might need to consider X, Y, and Z. So just kind of general statements. So are no, I'm talking about, so I think we have parents that are intimidated by the school board. Like they don't feel like they can participate because they don't understand the rules of the game. Ah, got it. And, um, <coughs> you know, for the least knowledgeable parent out there, where would they find that resource? Like, I mean, I, I just have shared my knowledge, but I mean, where could a parent go? Where would you right. direct them? For? Right, right. So it's interesting that you use the word participate because their participation really is at the ballot box in electing board members. So um, Oregon law allows for any of its governing bodies and subdivisions of which a school district board is a subdivision of the state of Oregon has to do their business in public unless it's one of the 10 protected reasons they can go into executive session. So they hold a meeting, it has listed in the notice the principal subject the board plans to speak about that night and if they plan to dispose or vote on anything um, generally is in a notice and people get to watch that but they don't necessarily have any right to participate in that so boards can invite people by their public participation policy that bddh policy they can invite people to speak to them at their meeting. And then those people can share their opinions with the board about any upcoming policy or any decision that the board is making and they can tell the board what they think. But they really don't have a participatory role. <coughs> uh, and then once the meeting is done, of course, the minutes let everybody know what happened. How did votes turn out? Who voted which way? what was a major discussion that led up to that vote, those kinds of things. Um, now, boards can certainly put together any kinds of committees that they would want to, and they, if they wanted to get community input on something, they can put together a committee and they can bring in various community members. That's how I got started. I spent, my, I spent a whole summer on a facilities committee. We met every Tuesday night throughout the summer. We looked at every building. We met with um, architects and all of these people that showed us the conditions of all of the building. And that committee's purpose was to make a recommendation to the school board about whether or not to go out for a bond, if the school board did go out for a bond, what projects should it entail, and how much money did we think that the school board should ask for in a bond. That was before I was on the school board. I was. <coughs> a community member that was in a way participating because I was on this committee and I was giving feedback to the school board and then the school board did what they did with it with that information so does that help Tamara yes <laughs> it's not the answer you wanted um, or not the answer the parents wanted no I just I mean it's you know I mean, I, I can uh, relate uh, to people having, you know, challenges and coming and talking about it. And um, I just, as I direct them to the, you know, you need to talk to administration. That's really where your answer lies yeah. and or the school board. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's um, there's obviously a lot of complexity that goes into that. Yes. So, yeah. That it was helpful just to share that part. <laughs> Tamara, yeah, you can. They're certainly able to write letters. They could submit letters to the school board, you know, so they don't have to show up at a meeting. They could submit comments in writing. Well, Tamara asked about time, uh, yeah, she time did. obligations, and that's really what your question comes back to: is how much are you really willing to give? Is it forty hours a week? I mean, most of us have jobs, if we if we're not blackballed from school districts, and uh, so like. It's, it, do you want to organize committees to educate people on how to participate and how to, how to understand Robert's rules? Do you want to go out there and knock on doors and, and try to talk to people individually, schedule meetings with different stakeholders? I mean, that stuff takes a lot of time. Yeah, I have no interest. That's on, I was just curious. 
kind of that's on you <laughs> that's on you how much you want to get the community involved so um there's policy bbaa you might want to write that one down policy boy boy apple apple that talks about the individual board member authority as an individual member of the board um, and so that is something that, um, as individuals, you might want to look at and see, like, once you take that oath of office and you swear to uphold the Constitution of the state of Oregon, <laughs> you are also swearing to upholding district policy. Yeah. And so the B section is predominantly about the board. So get really familiar with your B section policies because if you have any question about what boards should be doing, the answer probably lies there. And BBAA speaks to the individual and how as an individual you might want to engage in various activities. Um, BBF is another one I strongly recommend that you know. Um, I can call BBF the board best friend. It's the board member standard of conduct and it is what the, the board, your, whatever board you're on, it is what the board has agreed is gonna be how we're gonna conduct ourselves as members of this board. This is, these are gonna be our code of conduct. I always recommend that boards review those policies at their organizational meeting in July so that everybody knows what the expectations are and if there's ever any consternation with anything in there, well, it's board policy, so take it through the revision process. You have a policy that says how you will revise policy. Um, which, yeah, it's funny, huh? You laugh on that one, right? But there is, there's policy on how you revise policy. So is this OSBA policy? No, 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 this is yours. No, we give recommendation. We give sample policies to school districts that wanna participate in that service. So we have sample policies we can make available, but each board individually adopts their own district policy. So when you're referencing the BBAA, is that North Wasco? No, no, you will have one in South Wasco. You oh, will it's have called one that for the ESD. <laughs> Got it. Everybody in the state's policies have the same letters that <coughs> code them. The language inside is locally decided. So what your standard of conduct is, yours in South Wasco, might differ from what is in North Wasco. Your BDDH, that public participation policy that I talked about a little bit ago about how is it that the public can communicate with boards, yours might look different than theirs and might look different from yours. So your, your code is gonna be the same, but the language is locally different. So the B section is what? Yes, Cindy. Cindy. Finish your thought. Oh, I'm sorry, it's gone already. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting closer to 60 every day. Question. So um, can you do a quick, just a quick clarification about the school board meeting is held in the public, so it's not necessarily a public meeting. Yeah, can you just briefly just Yeah. So we have this little thing in the United States called Watergate in the 70s. <laughs> and as a result of Watergate, most um, governments decided that they were going to expose the governing process to the light of day. And some states call these sunshine laws. And so Oregon, um, we call them public meeting laws. And so what that means is that as a governing body who is making decisions, for the oversight of your agency, your local education agency, that all has to be done in the light of day, except for the 10 areas where you have protection to meet an executive session. And you have to do all of that in public. So it's, it's a meeting held in public, your meetings are. They are not public meetings in the sense that anybody can come and participate. So when you know our senators come through here, or our, I'm thinking um, mostly U.S. So like if Ron Wyden comes through and he holds a town hall, that's a public meeting. Anybody can come and they talk. There's usually a process, but it's generally held because Ron Wyden wants to hear from the people in his state, and so he holds a public meeting where people come and talk at him and tell him all the things that they're concerned about for him to represent their interests in DC. School boards 
are not pub school board meetings are not public meetings in the sense that they're open to anybody to come and talk at you. The public meeting aspect means you just have to hold your meeting where everybody can see and hear it. It's like being in a fishbowl. It can be really uncomfortable sometimes to have to have some of those conversations out in the open. But we can thank Watergate for the fact that we do. And so we hold those out in the open. Now, somebody asked about committees of the board, and it was Susan. <coughs> if the board wants there to be a committee, like that facilities committee that I served on, or any other kind of committee, that committee is also subject to those public meeting laws. So the meeting has to be noticed, and there has to be minutes kept, even if no board members serve on that committee. But by virtue of the fact that the board asked that there be a committee, and ultimately that committee is going to report back to the board, like we did on the facilities, we made a recommendation for a $30 million bond to include these various projects. That was that committee's recommendation to the school board. That's, those meetings were all open to the public by public meeting law. Now, if the school board is grappling with something, we can use a calendar for example, we'll just, you know, we're grappling with something, we know we're gonna be making a decision about a calendar, and we tell the superintendent, hey, bring us a calendar that's gonna accomplish X. But we don't tell her how to do that. But she decides she's gonna to put together a committee of employees to look at all of these different aspects of school work and make a recommendation to her. And then she's gonna bring that recommendation. That committee is not subject to public meeting law. That's a part of how she does her job. And she can pull to, together committees or she can do work on her own. However she chooses, she's running the ship. But if the school board asks that there be a calendar committee, rather than just asking their one employee to bring a recommendation for a calendar, the school board asks that there be a calendar committee. Now that's subject to public meeting law. Does that help, Susan? Is that kind of what you meant? Mm -hmm. So that's the difference between a meeting held in public and a public meeting. They are different. You have to hold your meetings in public. You do not have to give anybody a right to talk. I mean, nobody has a right to talk at you. That is a, a courtesy that you extend to your public so that you can feel like that you are getting information you need as their representatives to make appropriate decisions. But you get to control that process. And in the back of your handout, um, is some information about that. So starting on page 10 are some common issues that boards face. Complaints, how does the board and staff communicate, what's the board's role in hiring, what if an individual board member wants something, what do you, how do you deal with surprises, superintendent evaluation, flip the page, go over to 11, Disagree and commit, that's the one voicing. And then lastly, public participation in meetings. Here is an example of what one school board does about a notice that they give to people who want to speak at their board meetings, how that process works. And then on the back page, um, this is page 12 is some more of that notice about how one school district does it. And on the last page is how North Wasco School District does it. I don't know how South Wasco School District does it. I'm sorry, I don't know for the ESD how they do it. But you get to decide what your processes are, how long people can talk to you, so on and so forth. Um, we encourage boards to be mindful that if somebody is presenting to the board on any particular topic, to not engage in conversation and dialogue and certainly not make it look like that you're making a decision because you haven't had a motion, you haven't voted, you haven't gone through the proper processes to be making a decision. Um, so generally boards, we encourage boards to not, individual board members to not speak back to the person presenting, um, but just to, to hear what they have to say and thank them for their comments. It's a different conversation 
if you've invited somebody to your board meeting and you have made them an, an agenda item, like you've invited an auditor to come <coughs> and sit down and talk to you about your annual financial audit, then you engage in all the questions, dialogue, and conversation that you want. But if your auditor just happened to show up at your board meeting, uninvited, not on the agenda, and wanted to speak to you, they could speak to you through your process, however you've defined your public participation process, but you probably wouldn't engage in all that. So um, you mentioned audit. I found it very interesting that when the audit is discussed in a, in a meeting, like the public really isn't privy to what's being discussed. So but the audit is a public document. The audit is a public document. So, um, and it probably was included in your board member packet. So as a board member, you'll get a packet of material that'll prepare right. you for any meeting. Uh -huh. And if the audit is an item that's up for discussion at that board meeting, the audit is probably included in your packet. And anything that's included in the packet, if it's not confidential, is available to anybody in the public. Well, that could be very expensive to provide copies to everybody. It could be. So they could actually follow along and see what you're talking about. It but, could be. But you're saying we have a public obligation to discuss that publicly, right? Well, everything you do is at a public meeting unless it's one of those 10 reasons for executive session. Right. So it would be discussed in public. So the audit would be discussed. A lot of times what happens is the auditor comes uh -huh. and answers any questions that the board may have. 99% of the time, board members stare at their auditors like deer in a headlight and don't know what questions to ask. Um, most of the time. And so they just take the report of the auditor and thank you very much and everybody all goes home. But Stephanie, but isn't that conversation with and for the board? Yes. It's not for, the, it's back to that Elected public representation. Meeting, well, public meeting versus a meeting in public. Yes. So all of that information about the audit is being presented to the board. In doing their financial oversight. And so the public is privy to hearing that conversation, <coughs> but not engaging in that conversation. They're not engaging in the conversation, but they could review the actual right. audit if they wanted to. It's a public yes. document. And would probably be included in the minutes or however else. It'd be included in the packet and probably also in the later. minutes. Uh, so they could see that, but they and they could follow along in the conversation. But you're absolutely right. It's for the board to do their financial oversight. That two treasures, children and money. Right. <laughs> you know, so to do the financial oversight, and um, oftentimes, like I'm saying, this happens every year. Boards get audits every year of the finances, and they receive those from their auditors, and they're there <laughs> at the meeting, and they say, any questions, and boards don't even really know what to ask. What you're looking for is, is it clean? Is it a clean audit? You have a $6 billion discrepancy. <laughs> Approved! <laughs> so that does remind me of that one uh, kind of question, this one. Oregon requires that school districts operate on what's called a balanced budget. So revenues have to equal expenditures. We cannot deficit spend. School districts um, have to operate with the money that's given them in that year for those expenses. And there's a kind of a convoluted, delayed funding with budget reporting from the state and the Department of Education that we have a free webinar on our website that anybody wants to watch it can find out more about school funding and finance and how it works and I'm not going to go into that level of detail because that's <laughs> a long presentation. But we cannot deficit spend in school districts. So we, we and if we have money in a budget and we are finding through the course of the year there's unexpected expenditures or whatever and the district needs to uh, move money around inside that budget, then that take if, if it's a certain percentage, if it meets a certain threshold, then it takes a board resolution to do that. So every year boards adopt a budget. <coughs> I don't know your budget. I'm just going to fictitiously pick a number, okay? This is not scientific. But we got $10 million to operate on this year. We know all our sources of revenue are going to add up to $10 million. And so that's our budget for the year. We know we're going to get that much money. So the superintendent and her team and whatever, they get together and they say, well, we're going to spend this $10 million in this way. And we would like to, at the end of the year, 
still have $500,000 left over that we don't spend, that we call an ending fund balance, and that then goes moves into the next year as part of the next year's millions of dollars. Now, I'm not saying that things can't happen that expenses go haywire in a year. I'm not saying that that can't happen. Generally, as insurance, if like there's a school fire or something, and there's going to be a lot of money that goes out, you know, through the budget. <coughs> but um, generally, it's been my experience that school districts operate within their budgets. Um, I'm not a budget watchdog. I don't know otherwise. But every year there's a budget committee meeting. Every year a budget's approved. Every year a budget is audited. So I'm a little confused when you asked about deficits, and I don't want to take up the, we got four minutes, so I don't want to take up the rest of the group meeting to talk about your concerns about North Wasco in this public forum, but generally they don't have budget deficits. Um, they're not allowed to in Oregon. We have to have a balanced budget um, for education in Oregon. So we have four minutes left. Um, there's information in your booklet, like I said, those common issues that um, we've talked through. Um, again, just to summarize, the board is responsible for governance. You set the direction, you set the oversight, you set where we want the school district to go, what we want it to result in in terms of education for our kiddos. And, um, and then you let the superintendent manage that process and you hold the superintendent accountable through the evaluation process, through that holding the system accountable that we talked about. Um, certainly willing to, to stay and have one-on-one -on -one conversations. I started on time. I'm determined to end on time and respect people's time that have other things that they need to do on a Saturday. Um, I am certainly willing to stay and have conversations until Cousins kicks us out of the room or we can go to the parking lot. Um, sometimes we came into the room thinking school board work was one thing and we're finding out perhaps that it was another. Um, we used to think this and now we think that. Um, I would hope so. If you want to get a hold of me? Uh, that is my contact. So, 1057. All right, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Renee. Appreciate You're welcome. It. Somebody wants to deal with the TV. I will let.